Hey everyone, I received the following tweet from Eric O'Gray, I like this guy a lot, and he said, Kev, I think taking on random internet dudes is beneath your station. If you really disagree with the position, you should take an actual scientist MD with the same opinion. But he's saying, don't, don't uh, pick on, pick on somebody my own, my own size. So he then linked Neil Bernard's video and he's basically saying, why don't you take a look at it and see if you want to criticize that one. So let's do that. Hi. I'm Dr. Neil Barnard. A new report from the Epic Oxford study showed that meat eaters were more likely to have heart disease, but less likely to have a particular kind of stroke called hemorrhagic stroke compared with vegetarians. Hemorrhagic stroke refers to bleeding in the brain. Now, the part about meat eaters being more likely to have heart disease is no surprise. But what about stroke? Are meat eaters somehow better off? Well, in a word, no. A 2016 meta-analysis show. It's really interesting how he says, but what about stroke? Um, after he says that it's not a surprise that ischemic heart disease is uh, less common among vegetarians than among meat eaters, but hemorrhagic stroke is, um, but it is surprising that hemorrhagic stroke is more common among vegetarians. Well, it's, what he's doing is rhetorical because everybody who's into the LDL cholesterol uh, plant-based literature knows about this association of hemorrhagic stroke with vegetarianism and low LDL. Um, Dr. Bernard knows about it, so it's basically just a, a rhetorical, um, he's pretending to be surprised at this finding, but it's extremely common. And to demonstrate that, let's take a look at the following set of papers. So um, I did this just by looking you know, for 10 or 15 minutes, of course, I've been, I've been familiar with this kind of literature for several years now, and anybody who's in the diet and nutrition space is familiar with this literature, but basically, um, here's a, a, a screenshot of MedPage today, low LDL cholesterol and hemorrhagic stroke, the title says, another study raises question about low lipids and, and um, intracerebral hemorrhage. And it says another study, meaning there's a lot of studies like this. Let's look at the next, uh, let's look a little bit further down on the page. Low levels of low density lipoprotein cholesterol were tied to a higher risk of intracerebral hemorrhage, an epidemiological study in northern China showed. After data adjustment, uh, hazard ratios were 1.65 for people with LDL concentration from 50 to 69, and almost 3 for people who were under 50 um, milligrams per deciliter, which is actually a really, really low. Um, LDL number, but certainly within the realm of of, um, of real world numbers. So okay, um, and it's in neurology. So that's a journal. It's also the most widely read and highly cited peer reviewed neurology journal. And it says L, uh, um, this is the paper that this is referring to: low density lipoprotein cholesterol and risk of um, intracerebral hemorrhage. And you know, it, it was actually published in 2019. And there's uh, some really big names on this paper as well. Uh, the conclusion of this paper is we observed a significant association between low LDL and high risk of intracerebral hemorrhage, in other words, hemorrhagic stroke, when LDL was below 70 milligrams per deciliter, and this association became non-significant above 70. Okay, so here's what their um, hazard ratio graph looks like. As you can see, at about um, 100 and all the way down to maybe 80, there's no significant difference. Um, there might be some difference that's not yet detected by this particular study, but it's not statistically significant. But as you get below, say, 70, then you start having a statistically significant increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke at a low blood LDL concentration. Um, July, you know, 2019 in neurology, the most widely cited neurology journal. So this is legit. Let's look at the New England Journal of Medicine, 1989. I mean, this is stuff that was going on a long time ago, and certainly Dr. Barnard is familiar with this. He's basically pretending not to be familiar with this. It says here in the abstract, we found that the six-year risk of death from intracranial hemorrhage was three times higher with men 
in men with serum cholesterol under 4.14 nanomol or millimoles per liter, which is um, 160 milligrams per deciliter, than those with higher cholesterol levels. And actually, 160 is not super low as far as I'm concerned. In fact, uh, mine is lower than 160. On the other hand, a positive association was observed between the cholesterol level um, and death from non-hemorrhagic strokes. So basically the idea is, is as your cholesterol goes down, your risk of hemorrhagic stroke goes up, while your risk of non-hemorrhagic stroke goes down. And then vice versa, as your cholesterol levels goes up, your risk of non-hemorrhagic stroke, in other words, ischemic stroke goes up, and your risk of hemorrhagic stroke goes down. Um, check out Stroke from 1989, another paper similar to this, and they looked at some Japanese-American men in Hawaii, and they, should, they see that there's a significant inverse relationship between serum cholesterol and risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Inverse was non-linear with higher incidence known only in the lowest um, quintile, which is consistent with that paper that we saw from the Chinese group where you saw the graph like this, and then it very quickly petered out. It's not a graph like this, it's a graph like this. It's sort of an exponential increase as you get down to a low cholesterol level. This health reports, I've never heard of this journal before, but it's another, it's more grist for the mill. But in any case, it's, it says at the end, it is concluded that blood cholesterol influences the development of stroke above and beyond that influence of blood pressure. Furthermore, its influence is opposite for hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic stroke, basically what I've just been saying. The relationship between blood cholesterol and atherosclerotic risk does not appear to be as strong for blood cholesterol and coronary heart disease. In other words, as your risk of coronary heart disease goes down, as your LDL goes down, your risk of ischemic stroke goes down at a slower rate. So it looks something like this heart attacks, ischemic strokes, while cholesterol is going down. It's, it's like this. That's how the risk goes. Low cholesterol as a risk factor hemorrhagic stroke, Okinawa, Japan, and uh, Japanese Circulation Journal, I think. The odds ratio of cerebral hemorrhagic stroke associated with low, um, with a serum cholesterol of you know, blow all these numbers, blah, 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 was 1.77.73. In other words, as you got below a certain cholesterol of 167, you, your risk was higher. And then as you got higher and higher in blood cholesterol, your risk became around 0.7. So about 30% lower than the people who had really low cholesterol. And it says low serum cholesterol is an independent predictor of cerebral hemorrhage in men. And I just want to explain the potential mechanism by which this might occur. I don't understand the mechanism. I'm not sure that scientists do understand the mechanism, although maybe you could talk to a lipidologist and they might, might be able to discuss this at greater length. But one idea that I think is worth looking at is this idea that basic blood coagulation factors might increase as LDL levels increase. For some reason, I don't quite understand. And if that's the case, then LDL levels might correlate and might even, and the same thing that causes high and low LDL levels might also cause high and low coagulation factor levels. In other words, as you get lower LDL, you get lower co coagulation factors, and as you get lower coagulation factors, you have a higher risk of bleeding in the brain. So that's my uh, short presentation on the research that shows that he should not be surprised about this finding because it's a common finding. I'm sure we could probably find more than 100 papers showing this finding. He's aware of this, but he's still saying the opposite because he is representing an organization that wants people to eat plant-based diets and doesn't want to represent plant-based diets as something that might have a downside to them. That's really problematic because in medicine, everything has a downside. Every treatment has a downside. In fact, in life, everything that you do has an upside and a downside, and we should be honest about these upsides and downsides to people because if we're not, then people won't trust us. And that's why people don't trust people in the diet health space is because of people like this. Throughout the rest of this video, he goes on and on and makes many claims that I consider misleading one after the other. I don't want to post the rest of this video because it's really technical. I think it'll bore most people to tears. I just want to end it on that particular note that I ended it on. I do think that cardiovascular disease is a really important problem. Plant-based diets can help to prevent cardiovascular disease and are an important intervention in doing so. They might even help with cancer and they might help with all-cause mortality as well, and they probably do. It's just that they do increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, especially as you get down to low enough LDL levels. That trade-off might be necessary. It might even be favorable and beneficial. If you have a high risk of cardiovascular disease, you should talk to your physician. Um, but I think people need the full information. The other really interesting tidbit I'll, I'll say about this is 
most of that risk for increased hemorrhagic stroke in the case of people with really high LD or really low LDL levels rather is in the elderly and might not actually be the case in people who are younger. There's a whole there's a substantial body of evidence to support that, which may suggest that plant-based diets might be a good idea in younger people. And then as you get older, maybe switching to um, eating more meat might be a, a good idea as well. And that actually scores as well with the literature on muscle mass. So older people who have less muscle mass have a much higher rate of hip fractures, frailty, and a much higher mortality than people with lower muscle mass. So. I think the takeaway from this kind of literature on hemorrhagic stroke is very similar to the takeaway on the BMI and muscle mass literature. You want to be lean and plant-based when you're younger, but as you get older, you want to make sure that you maintain your muscle mass and doing so through a meat-based diet, not a meat-based diet, but a diet with a substantially larger quantity of meat or maybe perhaps just more protein might be a really good idea to um, prevent these problems. That's very highly speculative, however, and this is not medical advice because uh, this is an area that's still extremely hazy. Plant-based diets are great when you're young. Take them. They have more potential risk in terms of hemorrhagic stroke when you're older. The last consideration is that maybe even though they have higher risk for hemorrhagic stroke is when you're older, they still reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer and other events. So if the trade-off still might be in favor of a plant-based diet, just perhaps maybe a more protein, higher protein plant-based diet with no meat or, or lower amounts of meat. But just be aware, these things are um, risks, and it's important to know the risks of the medical interventions and the health interventions that you undertake in order to improve your health. Thank you. And finally, I think the last reason to be aware of this particular potential trade-off is that if this trade-off does exist, and a substantial amount of evidence suggests that it does, a huge amount of evidence suggests that it does, then we want to know, okay, if we're using a plant-based diet, then what possible measures can we take to prevent this trade-off from happening and to make things all golden? Because if we just ignore the negative things and only focus on the positive things, then we lose the opportunity to make improvements on the interventions that we use. And I think that this is perhaps the strongest argument in favor of being realistic and aware of the trade-offs of the intervention that we're using in this particular case, plant-based diet. Thank you very much for watching.